In the game of golf, every hole begins with a tee shot. And over the years, players have been finding ways to drive the ball farther and farther and farther. In 1980, the hardest hitter on tour averaged 274 yards from the tee. But these days, the best players average closer to 320 yards, with individual drives sometimes clearing over 400 yards. But could those numbers go up? Today, we're going to look at why driving a golf ball 450 yards is almost impossible. To find out what it takes, I got a lesson from one of the PGA's hardest hitters. That looked a little better there. Used motion capture technology to compare my swing to the pros and looked at how changes to equipment have helped golfers drive even farther. We add additional layers to add speed. Now, before we dig into this question, let's clarify what we mean by longest drive. Because in golf, there are a couple different ways to measure a drive. One is called total distance and the other is called carry distance. Dustin Johnson is one of the top drivers in the PGA. His longest drive ever recorded, 489 yards. But that is using the total distance metric, which measures how far the ball flies through the air, then bounces and rolls before coming to a stop. Here's the thing, total yards doesn't always reflect a player's true range. If you're playing on a sloped course, your ball can roll a lot. And if you get a lucky bounce off a hard surface, it can add a ton of yards to your total drive distance. In 1992, Carl Cooper's tee shot from the third hole of the Texas Open ricocheted off a golf cart path and wound up traveling 787 yards before rolling to a stop. That's almost half a mile. The point is, if you want to examine the limits of human performance from the tee, the purest metric is arguably carry distance, not total distance. So what's carry distance? It's how far the ball travels through the air before making first contact with the ground so you get no bounce and no roll. I can carry it, you know, up to about 330 in the air because we play all different courses, you know, firm, soft, whatever style of course, like, so I always just look at carry numbers because then you can always figure out how far it's going to roll out. Because carry is going to be affected by things like wind, it's going to be affected by the humidity, what altitude you're at, but the total distance, that's like what kind of course you're on, right? right. What kind of grass it's like, what kind of elevation you're at or what kind of slope there is on the course. It's a lot less relevant to your play. Exactly. So we're going to focus on carry distances. I thought it was a shot of the year. It really was. Right about now, some of you might be wondering about long drive competitions, where players compete to crush the ball as far as they possibly can. And we'll come back to those, I promise. They're actually where we got our 450 yard limit. But to understand long drive competitions, you first need to appreciate how drives work on the PGA. So I met up with Dustin Johnson at his home course in Central Florida to learn the basics. I am going to go try driving, and I would love, if you have the time, to just watch me for a little bit. Sure. Give me a couple tips. I'll even tee it up for you for the first time. <laughs> then you're gonna have to do it after that. <laughs> now, I hadn't swung a club in almost 20 years, but I figured I'd at least be able to hit the ball. Just contact is all you're trying to make. Like I said, contact. <laughs> Things were really out of whack. My grip wasn't right, my stance was off, but with a little practice and lots of patience from Johnson, hey, I eventually made some progress. That was a good one. Just so your weight's on we recorded our shots using a radar system called TrackMan, which captures things like distance, spin rate, and where the balls land. Most of my drives were well under 200 yards, while most of Johnson's traveled closer to 300. And unlike me, he wasn't swinging as hard as he could. The fact is, distance doesn't matter that much if your shots are landing all over the place, like mine were. DJ's drives have a lot of power, but they're also precise and accurate. But being able to hit the ball really far is obviously still crucial. So in terms of fitness and strength, what is the most important piece of the puzzle in terms of maximizing your drive distance? Um, the most important piece would probably be the legs. Uh, you know, you, you create a lot of power from, from your lower body and your legs, and then you know, obviously flexibility in the upper body, but you know, in strength. I mean, you're kind of using your whole body, so it's all very important. And then there's technique. There are several parts of the swing to consider. There's the starting position, the backswing, top of the backswing when the club briefly pauses, the downswing, impact, and then the follow through. The pros are very consistent, highly consistent. That's Stanford's Jessica Rose, who co-authored a study comparing the swings of professional golfers to amateurs. 
it is that smooth, fluid movement with no hesitation that creates that uh, power generation. Rose says that driving is essentially a sequence of rotations, with energy and momentum being passed from the legs, hips, and lower back to the shoulders, arms, and wrists. Each of those rotations works like a link in a chain. If one of those links breaks, the drive suffers. To emphasize just how different the pros are from amateurs, they ran my swing through a motion capture analysis and compared it to their database of professional golfers. Now, perhaps the biggest uh, difference in your swing compared to the pros is the backswing, it's muted, your S factor, so your tilt of your shoulders are much less than the pros. Look how much less my shoulders tilt than Johnson's. It's a major break in my kinetic chain, causing me to sacrifice distance on my drives. That's the thing. Peak rotational velocities are important, but maybe even more important is linking each of those rotations together. Once you've mastered that fluid movement, TaylorMade Golf's Brian Basil says that the ingredients for a long drive are actually pretty easy to define. So for a long drive, you really need four things. You need to optimize four things. You need head speed, so that really comes down to the player, how fast you can swing. We can change it through club length and uh, the weight of the club. Ball speed. So how solid do you hit it and how efficient and how, how good is that driver so you get the most out of it. Third, launch. You need to launch it high, but you have to have the right spin rate to go with it. So 17 degrees of launch and say 1500 RPMs of spin, high launch, low spin would maximize carry and roll. May not be the most playable right. launch condition, but it certainly would get you distance. But when it comes to golf, a player's game also has a lot to do with their equipment. In fact, it can have such a big effect on performance that the United States Golf Association has rules about the size, shape, and weight of players' clubs. The size of the head, 460 uh, cubic centimeters, is ultimately the, the, the larger size, and all the drivers today, for the most part, are there. The length of the golf club, 48 inches is, is, the, is the rule, albeit most players are less than that, 45 and a half inches is typical. The USGA's rules are meant to standardize the game, but they also limit players' power. One of the most important restrictions has to do with something called coefficient of restitution, or COR. In essence, this tells you how much energy is transferred in a collision between two objects, like a club and a ball. If you swing two otherwise identical clubs at the exact same speed, the one with the higher COR will hit the ball farther. So we're looking at the inside of an M6 driver head. So you'll see the, the carbon fiber, the titanium, even the slots down in the bottom here. This is all to, to maximize the use of weight and the flexibility. The back of the face, inverted cone technology, that spreads the COR. COR is described as a number between zero and one. Current regulations don't allow for a club head to exceed 0.83 COR, but with modern materials and design methods, Equipment manufacturers can actually exceed that number. So we'll make this face over the COR limit to begin with, and then we'll measure each head. We'll inject a certain amount of resin to bring that head back to the legal limit. We'll measure it again. We'll feed that back through the system, and we continue to do that on every single head that we make. And then there's the ball itself. There's a lot of engineering and, and science that goes into the design of a golf ball to make it perform the way it does. How important is the ball in the player, club, ball equation? Um, in terms of distance, uh, it's played a critical role in driver distance over the last 20 years. When wound golf balls were the most popular on tour, those golf balls generated a lot of backspin. So what's happened with solid constructions or multi-layer constructions is the golf ball spins less off the driver which over the years has given the player the ability to further increase launch angle. Launch angle coupled with lower spin is going to give players more distance. A lot of people associate a golf ball as being this really hard object, yeah. but it's actually quite elastic, right? It and it's, it's a function of how hard it's being hit that you see that elasticity sort of come to life. That's right. I would, I would consider the golf ball a spring. Uh -huh. There's not only the golf ball that's compressing, and that face is another type of spring. So it's the combination of the two that give you the ultimate ball speed. Mm -hmm. So the, there's the driver design and maximizing you know, the, how that golf ball comes off the face with the driver design, and then there's the golf ball design trying to maximize velocity just within the golf ball itself. 
Some of the earliest golf balls were filled with feathers, and over the years, manufacturers have tried all kinds of things to improve their performance. As recently as 20 years ago, some balls had liquid inside of them. You ask most people, you cut a golf ball in half, what would you see inside? I don't think most people would have any idea. Yeah, this has, um, so this has a this urethane, has cover, urethane cover, and, and then it has uh, windings uh, that are, are there to help increase velocity and help generate spin. And this one, this particular ball has a solid center. There are other golf balls like this one that's filled with corn syrup. You hear it? It's a great sound. Oh, oh! <laughs> uh, that is corn syrup. Uh -huh. That Oh, and look at that. So. <laughs> As, as we, he says the corn syrup was supposed to help reduce spin. The they also wrapped the ball's cores in rubber bands, so which offered like, players control, but at the expense old. of range. Yeah. But starting around the turn of the millennium, players all began to favor hand. balls made from concentric layers of rubber and plastic that allowed them to hit the ball far in this some circumstances core. and with control in others. And this is what those look like on the inside. The modern golf ball is going to be composed of a rubber inner core, uh, polybutadiene, and it, you can change the, 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 the compression of that core to, depending on what type of performance you want. And then the golf ball is going to have multiple layers depending on what you're trying to achieve and what type of player you're targeting. Um, on our TP5 and TP5X, we use a five layer construction, which starts with that soft polybutadiene core. And then we add multiple layers, three additional layers that are going to add speed. The last layer is that familiar outer shell. Talk to me about the importance of that dimple pattern. The dimples in general, they create less drag. Um, when you think about a golf ball, it's a sphere. And ultimately, it's really not the most aerodynamic uh, body. It's, uh, it creates a wake when it's going through, when it's punching through the air. And what the dimples do is they reduce the drag by about half. The USGA has size and weight restrictions designed to limit a ball's performance too. It has to be at least 1.68 inches in diameter and weigh no more than 1.62 ounces. They also test balls to see how far they travel under very specific launch conditions. When struck by a standardized club at a standardized speed, no ball may travel more than 320 yards. If it does, players can't use it. Naturally, some players hit harder than average, which is why they can drive farther than 320 yards. Sometimes a lot farther. But, uh, he's really starting 2019 off and that plane. brings us back well. to long drive. It's, well, exactly what it sounds like. A sport in which players compete to drive a golf ball as far as they possibly can. In April, long driver Tim Burke won a competition with a monstrous 474 yard drive. But that was his drive's total distance. So what was his carry? Watch again, it's right around 450 yards. Here's the thing, long drive competitions used to allow equipment that violated USGA rules, and that made it tough to compare to the PGA. But these days, the clubs and balls that long drivers use all technically conform to the USGA's specifications, but they're right at the limit. Take club length, for example. Most players on the PGA use clubs between 44 and 45 inches. But long drivers opt for the maximum allowed 48 inches. They also rely on more aggressive mechanics, club faces with less loft, and more compressed balls, all of which combine for, you guessed it, longer drive distances. So don't expect to see anything like that on the PGA Tour anytime soon. Why not? In the PGA, remember, the ultimate objective is to get to the hole. So accuracy and precision are really important. There is almost no incentive to ever completely sacrifice control entirely in the name of distance. Based on everything that, that I've studied, the golfer would still have to make a significant improvement, again, in their fitness to be able to swing harder at it. Yeah. I mean, we see long drive guys do it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's definitely possible. You, you just have to swing incredibly hard and you have to have all the right things line up. Maybe one day, the USGA's rules will allow players to use clubs with more efficient energy transfer or farther flying balls. Or maybe we'll see larger courses that encourage players to hit even longer drives. But until that happens, remember that what professional golfers are doing is already almost impossible.